Normally at this point, uh, we go back and we talk about the first exposure to YouTube. I'd like to go even further back than that and find about your childhood experiences and your first exposure just to knitting in general. We have very different backgrounds. Um, we're both Scandinavian. My mother is Spanish, my father is Swedish, but my father worked uh, for a really big company um, for Ericsson Telecommunications uh, when I was born. So I grew up in, um, in these really big cities in, in South America and we didn't move back to Scandinavia until, um, until I was 13 years old. But my experience with knitting was my mother and her friends uh, at the club, they, they would do their knitting in the, in the 80s when it was very popular. Um, and I kind of observed them. And I grew up on a small farm north of Lillehammer, the Olympic city. Oh, yeah. And I grew up on a farm with four generations. So I had my mother, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother, and they were all knitters. So I learned to knit when I was very little. I don't remember when I started. But that was just something you did in between working on the farm, because you shouldn't just sit there and not do anything. Was that more of a knitting for pleasure or hobby or was that something you guys needed to knit to have clothing i don't think we needed all of it but we yeah. we made it for for ourselves or for the family there's a very deep culture in scandinavia for knitting we are situated in the northern hemisphere in a part of the world where our, our winters are are quite long we jokingly say that we have two winters here we have a green one and then a white one um <laughs> so pretty much cold all year round. It kind of makes sense that people knit here yeah. in, in Scandinavia because of the fact that you can actually wear your knitwear here um, throughout the year. And also it's like when I grew up, it was like a waste of time not doing anything. Like the women in my family, they always had something they were knitting on or crocheting. It, I, th I think it was kind of a, a lifestyle or yeah, the way sure. it was it's, actually. Yeah, it's a way of life. Uh, was that true for both boys and girls generally? No, when I started to knit, it was a little bit weird that a boy was knitting because that mm. was like very old fashioned. Men were knitting like way back in time. I, I think I was looked at as a little bit strange when I grew up. I knew I was strange and I just knitted more. You just embrace the strangeness is what we should be doing. Especially when you live in a small community, you have to be, you have to embrace your strangeness if you want to survive. Uh, Arne and Carlos was started, I believe, in 2001. How did you two come together to, to, to start this venture? I had just graduated from university. Um, I'd spent some time in China as well. I made some really good friends um, from Norway um, at the time. And then I got some offers to go to Norway to work. And so I met Arne. I was a teacher in a French fashion school in Norway. And one of my students, she came from China. She knew Carlos. And then I was tired of being teacher. And then we decided to create a brand together. Together. Yeah. Start our own business and kind of become our own um, boss and do things that we wanted to do instead of being told what to do. So that was shortly after you guys first met each other. Well, we met in 1999 and uh, we launched our brand in 2002. So we, in between there, we actually left the city. Uh, we were in Oslo. About six months after we met, Arne bought the train station where we now live. At one point, we decided to leave the city and kind of figure out how we wanted to start our business, what we wanted to do. Um, it had to be design related because that was our kind of the thing that we, we did. We came up here in, in 2000, in the year 2000, and we spent, uh, we spent two years uh, working part time, uh, doing different kinds of jobs, the jobs that we could get around here. And, uh, and then in 2002, we launched our Arne and Carlos brand. The idea from the beginning was it was going to be an international brand. So um, a lot of people thought we were really strange that, uh, you know, we're going to start a fashion house pretty much and then move out into the middle of nowhere on top of a mountain. But it worked. Yeah, it was a clear <laughs> choice for us. And we knew that we weren't going to be, you know, fixated on, 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 on Oslo. We, we're going to going to discover the or the world was going to discover us and we were going to get out to the world anyway so it didn't really matter where we lived and what was the your design business focused on at that point was it designing patterns or was it for designing clothing for for retailers we launched a women's wear brand originally um and uh, we showcased it in these you know independent uh, designer trade shows in, in Copenhagen, Paris, and in New York. So from 2002 until 2007, 
uh, we worked with women women's wear selling our designs or ready to wear to the to our customers who were the, the clothing stores um, and we were positioned in a high-end market so um, it was actually very difficult mm. and it wasn't until we actually changed our concept instead of doing women's wear we uh, we decided to to focus on knitwear um, and and then also do menswear uh, accessories. When we relaunched our brand in 2008, uh, now as a just purely knitwear, um, we kind of hit the jackpot, and suddenly uh, yeah. we were uh, we were in in two three hundred of the most fashionable stores in the world, from from uh, California all the way to Japan. What what brought about the change? What made you decide to switch to just knitwear? After a while, like when we looked at our collections. They looked more like a flea market when you saw <laughs> hanging on the rack because we had like a little bit of everything. It wasn't focused enough. No, and then we also get got really good feedback on the knitwear. Yeah, because we we did a lot of uh, Nor Norwegian inspired knitwear, mm. so it was very popular, like in America and in Japan sure. and Italy. It was really hard to sell in Norway. Yeah, because at that time. Everybody in Norway thought that Norwegian knitwear were too old fashioned. And then we, when we were doing our women's wear line, at one point we had a full collection of about 35 pieces. And out of those, we had five or four or five knitted pieces. And we were doing a, a trade show in Paris called Who's Next? A French designer, a uh, friend of ours, uh, came to see us and, uh, because he was also exhibiting at the same trade show. And he had a friend with him. And then he introduced us to his friend by saying, um, this is Arne and Carlos, and they make the most amazing knitwear you'll ever see. And when he said that, it kind of, something in my head kind of <laughs> clicked because I, I hadn't seen that until the point when he said it. And then I said to Arne, I think we have to do, we have to rebrand everything and just do knitwear because that's really what we know how to do. And from there on, it kind of just snowballed. Uh, and uh, very quickly, we had very big success uh, in that. Are they mostly Nordic designs or, or Norwegian designs with sort of uh, with a more modern twist? Or are you mostly going for traditional designs? We try to make like make a new twist on it. The design of the garment should be very traditional, but we have to do something with the patterns. We can't just take an old pattern and use it as, as it is. And at the time, at the time when we launched our first knitwear collection, the, the trends in the world then for the for high fashion were pretty much these you know obscure unknown little labels small retailers who you know maybe had a story um so we came with this kind of edgy scandinavian knitwear inspired but with a twist modern but but also at the same time respecting the the heritage and the tradition as that we have here in scandinavia and uh, i think that's the reason why it really took mm -hmm. off and it kind of culminated when we landed a collaboration with Comme des Garçons, which is, uh, which is one of the most respected uh, fashion brands in the world. The Ray Kubo is an icon. And uh, for us to be selected by her to work with her and um, design a collection uh, together with her was quite um, incredible. And that happened at that particular time. It wouldn't happen now, but back in 2008, that was what everybody was looking for. So we were kind of lucky in a way. Mm -hmm.